Oh, go on, Fran. No. Go on, Fran, get your top off. No, I'll get cold, it's raining, no. Get your top off. Go on. No, you take yours off. I can't, it's fixed. Okay. There are a few important points about the C1 before you even move, and number one is getting it back onto its wheels, and you don't just kick the stand off. I've got to, let me get this right, I've got to lift this lever here and lift the bike sort of onto its wheels again, and then this lever <coughs> retracts the centre stand. Then there's the matter of your seat belts, because it won't actually start until you belt it in, which isn't something I'm used to doing on a bike. I'm strapping myself to a giant hula hoop with wheels on. Um, right, and then, of course, because this is the UK and not Europe, you can't actually wear it, although it was designed to be worn and ridden without a helmet. You've got to wear a helmet, which is on the floor. <laughs> well, these are supposed to be all-weather scooters, and this is the weather to test them in, so... Here we go. Yeah, well, it's all right for you with your fixed roof, but if you think I'm going out and getting wet... <laughs> BMW is so unlike a scooter, it's hard to imagine it has anything in common with any two-wheeled vehicle. It is a seriously strange feeling. As soon as you tilt the bike into the corner, the extra height in front of your face of the windscreen and supports accentuates the amount of lean. You feel like you're going to fall over. Franza Diva is actually far more like a scooter. Basically, it's an ordinary two-wheeler with a little extra roof stuck on top. Who'd have thought that for just a few grand you get a Mercedes SLK folding roof? Trust Fran to pick the flash one. You know, you don't so much park and stop on this thing as come into land. Stand down, drop onto stand, and then I've got to unbuckle myself and I've got a quick release button. I don't know if you could combine that maybe with an ejector seat. Well, the end result is, all the bits of me down the middle are quite dry, but everything down the outside is a bit soggy. But think about it, who are you kidding? How's a strip of plastic that wide going to keep it completely dry, unless the rain's coming perfectly head on or perfectly from above? So whilst on the move, I've had a bit of time to look around and I've found even more gizmos. Apart from the fact that the build quality in here is excellent, as I suppose you'd expect from somebody like BMW, I found a mobile phone holder, I found an interior light, and I've even found a sunroof. Which is unbelievable, I have no idea why. So the Adiva is basically a scooter with a roof. It has no elaborate stands like the C1 and it has no radical interior light or seat belts or roll bars. It does have slightly better weather protection and space for a stereo. So I can sing along on my travels. Useful, I'm sure. Thing is, at about 3,200 quid, I can kind of see the point of the Adiva as a scooter with a bit of extra weather protection. But for £4,000 for the C1, that's a hell of a lot of money for a scooter. And no matter how radical it may be, that is still ultimately just what it is at heart, a scooter. So you fancy a bit of muscle, do you? Well, don't look at me. No, seriously, I'm talking about bikes. What could you suggest? Maybe a Honda CB1000, perhaps a Yamaha XJR, or even a Kawasaki ZRX or a 1200 Bandit. No, 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 forget them. I'm talking about real muscle. How about a Yamaha 1200 VMAX? Now the VMAX really seems to have that nasty boy image. And once you climb aboard, you really do get the feeling that nothing's gonna come even close in the old traffic light Grand Prix. 
The VMAX was born way back in 1984, but it wasn't officially available in the UK until 1991, when it arrived with its 1198 cc's of stonking liquid-cooled V4 performance. It does in fact come in two versions. There's one like this, which is a restricted one, 95 brake horsepower and it'll do 133 miles per hour. Doesn't sound that restricted to me. And then in 1996, the UK officially got the full power version, which will produce 121 brake horsepower and that'll do 156 miles per hour. But don't even think about riding any VMAX flat out, unless you're wearing a very strong neck brace and you've got some way of securing your hands to the bars and your arms to your shoulders. VMAX certainly is different, doesn't look much like any other machine. The uh, dashboard, for example, is kind of split in two. You've got the speedo up here on its own, mounted on the bars, and down here, the rev counter, temperature gauge, and warning lamps are on a kind of little console at the front of this tank. Tank, I said. It's not really a tank, it's a dummy tank. There is a storage box under there, but it's not very big. If you want to put petrol in your VMAX, you have to do this. A couple of catches there, just behind the back twin shocks. Flick them, and up it pops. Petrol filler cap there, and the tank is actually underneath the seat, which helps to keep the weight down, and this is quite a heavy beast. The tank actually only holds 15 litres of fuel, which, if you ride it fairly hard, will take you just a touch over 100 miles before you have to switch to reserve. Not very far, I know, but believe me, 100 miles hard riding on one of these and you'll be well glad of the rest. It really is built to go very fast in straight lines. It's absolutely crap at going round corners, to be quite honest with you. But one thing it does do very, very well is stop, thank goodness. Because at the front, we've got twin 282mm discs being squeezed by twin four-piston calipers. And at the back, a 290mm disc with a single twin piston caliper and they bring everything to a very very rapid halt. It really is incredible in a straight line, not so clever going around the corners, perhaps the weight's got something to do with that, it's a heavy beast, 262 kilos which is 576 pounds in old money, certainly takes a bit of shifting around. Anyway, by the time I get to the twisty bits, I'll be that far in front, I can slow down and let you all catch up. The full power version gets most of its performance from the V-Boost system, which very cleverly controls the fuel supply to the front and rear cylinders, and it adds extra fuel to the one that's firing. And believe me, when that starts to happen, you will know about it. The VMAX is a great bike. It makes you smile when you ride it, something good in that. And one thing that has surprised me is the price. I always thought VMAX is a kind of luxury item, not so really. The price for this particular bike, which is a 1998 import version, and it's restricted, but don't let that put you off, still a lot of fun. This on the road is less than 6,000 pounds. And if you do want to splash out and buy a UK model, unrestricted, full power version, that'll cost you about 9,300 pounds on the road. So there's the VMAX. All I need now is a new rear tyre. Well, this week we're once again at Tommy Rob Motorcycles in Warrington. Now, one thing guaranteed to attract the interest of everybody in the motorcycling world is the label World's Fastest Bike. And when it was introduced in 1990, that was certainly the case for Kawasaki's ZZR 1100. Now, often the first thing that people do when they approach a bike, and you'll see this every time you go to a bike rally, is they walk up and they look at the clocks. Now, why everybody looks at the clocks, I don't really know, but they do. Now, the first thing to strike you when you look at the speedo on this machine is that it goes up to an incredible 200 miles per hour. Now, the ZZR, well, it doesn't quite reach 200 miles per hour. But if you can manage to attain the top speed of around 175 miles per hour, then you're not going to be too worried about anything coming past you. And underneath this ballistic looking fairing, there's a 1052cc inline liquid cooled four cylinder engine with a double overhead cam and 16 valves and it's capable of producing around 123 brake horsepower. The gearbox is six speed but really the gearbox, well I think it should be at a three speed. It should be fast, very fast and good morning judge. 
Braking on this machine is absolutely outstanding. To the front, there are twin discs with twin piston calipers and they really are exceptionally powerful. And to the back, there's a single disc and a single piston caliper. The brakes really are up to the job. Although on a machine with the performance that this thing can do, really nothing short of a railway sleeper through the front wheel is going to stop you too quickly. The petrol tank, well a full tank is 21 litres of fuel and that will give you a touring range of over 200 miles. That's if you drive it, well, fairly sensibly. But with a bike like this, the performance that this thing is capable of, well, you can't really drive these too sensibly, can you? Well, try and keep up, I'll do my best. You don't have to drive this machine like a complete nutcase, but it's hard to resist. The worst thing you can do with a ZZR 1100 is start throwing it around like a sports bike, because although it may have the performance to match the Fireblades and Ducatis, it certainly hasn't got the same sharp handling due to its increased weight and a softer suspension. Although if you're pushing it hard enough for the handling to let you down, then you're missing out on the best feature. That being that it's one of the most comfortable sports tourers you're ever likely to sit on. In fact, the numb bum syndrome is virtually non-existent, with the silky smooth four-cylinder transmitting none of its vibrations through to the seat or the handlebars. Indeed, it's as well to keep an eye on the rev counter if you want some idea of what's going on down below. So if you want to travel a long way with as much excitement as you can handle, then this one's well worth a try and there's only one other bike on the road that could possibly leave you behind. Now then, where's that Blackbird? Well, we're now back in the showroom with the ZZR 1100. I've lost a few pounds in sweat and, uh, and I've managed to keep my licence intact, I think. Tommy, this is absolutely incredible. Now, you've ridden works Hondas, works Yamahas, won all sorts of championships and races and been just about everywhere fast on a bike, but this is serious performance, this, isn't it? Without a doubt, this has been probably the flagship of the Kawasaki range. It's been a bike that does everything that you want from a sports bike, but you can also add your luggage to it to give it touring bike appeal. And the performance of this is nothing short of absolutely sensational. Right. In fact, it's so sensational that even Hondas have now brought out the Blackbird to do battle with this particular model. Right, that's right. Because really, for the last five years or so, this has had the, uh, the this has been the top of the tree, hasn't it? There's been nothing to touch it speed-wise. No, without a doubt. The CBR 1000 Honda was the bike that was near to it, but the ZZR came in and took that all away from Honda, mm -hmm. and now they've come back with the other machine, but the ZZR is still a wonderful selling machine. Yeah, a cracking bike, it looks great as well. And something that I notice is you don't have to drive it like a lunatic. All right, the performance is there and the power's there if you wanna, if you wanna get excited, but it is a, can be a very sensible bike. It's uh, a bike that you can ride through town easily. Yeah, but as far as sports touring goes, I mean, I noticed that, I mean, they've actually thought about that. They've got little bungee straps on the That's seat right. and everything. I mean, so they sort of, and uh, up on the fair in there, there's a little cubby hole, which is a lockable compartment there. Uh, yep. So it's not an out and out sports, It'll com it's probably the best sports bike performance wise. I would say it would be and I'm not sure that these are for bungee cords, I think they may be for strapping your pillion passenger on. Right, yeah, aye, that's, well that would be an idea, yeah, well I suppose a big top box at all that, wouldn't it? So what are these with a set of luggage on the back? I Superb. Mean, the ultimate machine. A superb yeah. sports tour, there's no doubt about it. The suspension, the road holding, the riding position. Although it looks so, so sporty, it's actually got quite a nice upright riding position. Not one that goes for your wrists and gets you behind the shoulder blades. This is Kawasaki's yeah. flagship. Yep. Well, the only thing wrong with this bike is that it's not mine. It actually belongs to Tommy, which is very sad and he won't let me borrow it again. Well, I'll leave you with the rest of the programme, two wheels better, and I'm going to go and change my pants. Well, he did tell me that he's got something for me to road test that is black and red. It's not this. He thinks he's got one up on me, that Paul Johnston fellow. Well, I can tell you he hasn't. What he's done, he's obviously gone into a motorcycle showroom and chosen the biggest bike he could find. On the idea that it's too big for me to ride and do a road test on. Well, he's found this, and understandably, I can see what he means. It's a muscle bike, it's 1300cc, and you think it'd be too big for me. Well. It isn't. In fact, it's perfect. My feet reach the floor. So, I've got me a road test <laughs> and he's waiting for me to turn up on it. It's got a long wait.
look at this. Here's Wayne. Wayne the motorcycle tour. I think he's been on a world cruise or something. A week <sighs> I've been waiting. So a week? I've had, I've had two shaves, three showers. Do you know, it just felt like a, an hour or so, that's all. Well, where have you been? <sighs> I've been for a good ride and I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. And have you learnt anything about the bike in, in the week? Can you tell us anything? Inform us, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's red. It's a Yamaha and yeah. it's 1300 cc's. It is. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Can you sort me out with a, something else? Yeah. Oh, and by the way, it's run out of petrol. <laughs> That's very informative, isn't it? Now you know why we don't let him get involved with road tests. Looks like it's down to me again. So what can I tell you about this XJR 1300 that Wayne hasn't already told you? Well, probably loads and loads. It is indeed, 1300 cc's. It's a Yamaha, it's big and it's red. Ha, there's a bit more to it than that. It's a proper true retro machine, true retro muscle bike. Retro right from the front to the back. So many bikes these days call themselves retros, but they're not really. They've got a big chrome headlamp, and that's really where the retro theme ends, because they've got monoshocks at the back. Whoever said a monoshock was retro? I don't think so. This one, we're back to the old twin shocks. And even the engine looks retro. Look at that. It's air-cooled. In fact, if you took a picture of that there and said, name the year, you'd probably say 1970-something or 1980-something, because it really, really does look the part. No fancy fuel injection. Four McCuny CV carburettors, all works perfectly well. It's not rocket science, but it's perfect for this kind of machine. Big oil cooler on the front there. And a five-speed gearbox in this, as opposed to the more normal, or should we say more conventional, six-speed. And I'm led to believe it works perfectly well. Although talking to Wayne, I would never know that. So, looks like I'll have to find out for myself. The first thing you'll find out when you climb aboard the XJR 1300 is that it has to be one of the most comfortable bikes to ride. An excellent padded seat and well-placed bars. In fact, the whole machine feels perfectly balanced. There's plenty enough power, and if you really want to, you can have a go at mixing it with the boy racers. It's nowhere near as fast as some of your more dedicated sports bikes, but with no protection on this naked machine, you really don't want to be hurtling along at ridiculous speeds. It's far more suited to high-speed cruising around the country lanes. It's physically a large machine. You will get noticed on this bike. But having said that, it's not daunting. It's very, very user-friendly. Oh, you may have noticed, you should have noticed, that this is a little bit different to your standard XJR 1300. This, of course, is the SPS version. Now, they all do SPS versions and fancy limited edition versions. Honda do them, Aprilia, Ducati do them with the 996s and all that. So why not have an SPS retro machine like this? Nothing wrong with that. Two main differences between this and the standard model. One, perhaps the most obvious, is the paint job. Look at that. Yamaha speed blocks. A proper retro paint job, if ever I've seen one. Straight off an RD out of the 1970s, that, isn't it? Very smart on the tank and, of course, on the tail unit there as well. And you probably not fail to mention the shocks on this are different to your standard. Lots of people use different types of suspension these days. You've got your white power, your Pioli, your shower, all them. On this SPS, we're on Olin's shocks, which are used throughout the world on all the top super bikes. And, of course, they're fully adjustable. You can tweak them and tune them and set the bike up exactly the way you want it to feel. Look at that for a nice seat. Not only is it a nice, comfy stepped seat, but it's got all this nice quilting in it, these nice little quilted sections here. Again, perfectly in keeping with this style of machine. Not really much to show you under the seat, but we'll pop it off and have a look. Little compartment there, a couple of bits in there. Tool kit there, C-spanners there, so you can have a play with your rear suspension, but uh, nothing very exciting to tell you about under there. But it has got this bike. Two things that I think are really important, that are important to me when I'm looking at a bike. One is up there, a fuel gauge. I think every bike should have a fuel gauge, I keep saying it. And the second thing is, there, can you see it? A main stand, perfect, makes life a lot, lot easier. So if you are a fan of the retro scene and you're impressed by size, then this could be right up your street. If big really is beautiful, then this is about as good looking as things get. So this is the SPS version, therefore it's much more expensive. Well, no, it's not really that much more expensive. The standard machine 
XJR 1300 will cost you £5,800 to put on the road. This SPS model will cost you £6,200, so only just about £400 more, and for your 400 quid, you get a nice paint job and fancy rear suspension. I don't think that's bad, because if you bought the standard bike, you had it painted yourself and you treated yourself to some fancy new shocks, I think you could be looking at the best part of £1,000. So in today's day and age, I don't think that's bad value for money. Now, one other thing we must do. Wait, no, wait, no. One sec. Uh, I need you to do me a favour. Just, um, there's the key. Take it back. Apologise that you've had it for so long. Tell them you won't do it again. I want to uh, put some more petrol in it. Now, those European types love these great big enduro style bikes like the Africa Twin. It is actually a known fact that 9 out of 10 Germans have at some point or another leapt on one of these, bolted on those narrow metal panniers to the back and buggered off around the world. So there must be something right about them. But I've avoided trying one until now for one very good reason. <laughs> it's this bit of a problem. But it's not that bad. If you are like me, built more for compactness than anything else, once you're on board, those long, soft off-road springs compress and bring the ground almost within reach. And once you're rolling, well, it's really not a problem. The Honda Africa Twin 750 has been around for a few years now, so you could say it's getting a bit long in the tooth, or you could say it's a classic. Either way, it's certainly not changed much over the years. What you're not buying with an Africa Twin is a sophisticated machine loaded with cutting-edge technology. They're built and designed to look rugged, and in fact, they are rugged. So that's exactly what you get, a simple, solid machine, that long-travel, off-road-ish suspension front and back. The wheels with those tyres that look off-road, but uh, those are road tyres, they're not fooling anybody. Then you get a simple frame, cradling a simple V-twin 750cc engine that shares components with a dozen other 750s in the Honda range. On board, well, obviously, got these huge broad handlebars you're sitting almost bolt upright and in front of you is a dash layout that um, I don't know if it's a layout is a throw out really certainly nothing like a sports tour of bits and pieces clustered about all over the place but it's got everything you need you're not riding a tour you're riding a roughly tufty enduro but what's really amazing is what a good tourer it makes. That riding position is so comfortable for long journeys. Bolt up right, arms out wide, legs straight down below. Believe me, it's comfy. Now, of course, you'd have to be mad to attempt the Paris-Dakar on something like this. It is very much more a styling exercise after off-road rather than romping across hill and dale. But that long travel suspension means it irons out even the roughest of potholes. It's silky smooth. Anybody who's ever spent any time on this or even many other bikes in the same category will tell you what's also amazing is how well it goes around corners. The suspension compresses, it soaks up the bumps and it'll grip and grip and grip. You can get some serious lean on if you so choose. Mind you, it's quite a long way down. Some things I really don't get. Most computer games, those stupid little mini scooters, bikes with CD players, I don't get any of those. This, I actually do get. It might seem a really odd idea to go touring and use every day a bike that's styled to look like something you'd cross the desert on, but it actually makes a surprising amount of sense. That riding position, upright with your arms widely spaced, is hugely comfortable. Those great dollops of torque from that simple V-twin mean it is actually a delight to ride without feeling you've got to go at breakneck speed everywhere. And they're cheap best of all. This R-plated example with about 17,000 miles on the clock you'd pick up for four, four and a half thousand pounds and you could get one for less. Remember there's no need to buy desperately new with something like this, they're very long lived. So cheap, practical and durable. Maybe the Germans had it right after all. You know if you open a motorcycle magazine, <coughs> go and buy any motorcycle mag and have a look down the bike listings, the names of the bikes, the makers and the models, in particular the models. Every month we seem to be getting new models, new names, and you think, oh, how on earth am I going to remember all this lot? They're coming out all the time. But also, if you look closely, you'll see names that seem to have been there for years, for donkey's years. This is one such name. This name here, Honda Transalp, yeah. Been around for ages. Actually been around since 1987, can you believe? All that time. So they must have been doing something right, but it's grown up a little bit since then, back in 87. The Transalp was a 600cc V-twin motor. Well, it's still a V-twin, but it's grown up now to a 650cc. Well, actually, 649cc, I think it is. But there it is, still a V-twin, and it's the same engine as Honda used in the Deauville. And that's got a good reputation. That's become a bit of a favourite with motorcycle couriers. 
and they like machines or they like engines that are good for many tens of thousands of miles up and down the country all day long, seven days a week, some of them. So there won't be very much wrong with the motor. But it's not just grown up engine wise, it's grown up, I think, in its looks because it's still essentially an off road looking machine, off road style of bike. But I think it's becoming a little bit more road bike in its looks, in its bodywork. It's a bit more sort of streamlined now, shall we say, the way these indicators are all thrust into the fern. Oh, very, very smart. Perhaps lost that little bit of a rugged look that it had in its early days. And one other thing that you need to be careful of, I'll just show you this. Watch this. People with short legs should beware because this is a very, very tall machine. But that can be a good thing because sitting this high gives you a great view of the road ahead. The Transel isn't fast. It's not meant to be. It's got a nice, friendly sort of power delivery. Just about right for this style of bike. It really is an easy bike to ride. There's no nasty twitches. Everything's just very predictable and very sure-footed. It's more at home on the tarmac, but it won't complain too much on the odd muddy track. Suspension setup as standard is a bit too soft for any serious terrain, but you certainly wouldn't get away with this on your race replica. So while we're on the off-road theme, <laughs> let's have a look at the off-road bits and pieces on the Transalp. Well, the most obvious one is down there, bottom of the engine. Have a look at that. How's that for a sump guard, eh? Massive, huge, big bash plate on the bottom there, so that'll protect the bottom of the engine should you choose to do any off-roading over rocks and boulders and things like that. And also it'll protect the downpipe for the exhaust as well because the front cylinder comes right down there, right behind that. So that's all protected nicely. And then the exhaust along up here. Any off-road bike, any decent off-road bike has the exhaust up there, tucked up high, out of the way, out of harm's way where it can't get bashed and wrecked. And while we're on the back end here, nice big rack there, look at that. Big solid thing there, you could stick a top box on there, fill it up, you could strap luggage to it, you could do anything you like really. And somewhere nice and easy for your pillion to hang on to. And I've been riding this too up, I had a pillion on the back quite a bit, quite a few times. And it's nice with a pillion on the back, it's quite easy to ride, it doesn't upset the handling of it. And it's quite comfy for the pillion because the seat is pretty good. But if you don't like the seat, you can take it off. Wouldn't be much use if you took it off, would it? But there you go, it comes off like that. And there's not much to see under there. Big hole there, you could probably get a packet of crisps and a toothbrush in it, but, uh, but little else. So let's put that back on out of the way. Up here on the dashboard, come and have a look up here. There's nothing too fancy about it, but it just looks nice. It's full of rain at the moment, of course, but it's nice and classic. It's well finished, it's well done, it's nicely put together. And over here, the left-hand side, my favourite, I'm always moaning about it, fuel gauge we've got a fuel gauge we like bikes with fuel gauges but going on the off-road thing still on the off-road theme we've got these over here on the top of the bars One on each side of course these knuckle guards hand guards stop you bashing your fingers as you're going down the dirt track stop all the branches bashing your fingers but i suspect that most people who own a transalp won't go on the dirt tracks because let's face it the off-road ability of this is shall we say somewhat limited but these are actually great for keeping your hands warm because when you get cold fingers, when you're riding a bike, the things that make your hand cold is the wind. It's the wind chill that makes your knuckles freeze and makes your fingers freeze up. Well, them help to sort of stop the wind blowing on your hands. So they do keep your hands quite warm. So very useful, even on a road bike. Doesn't have to be an off-road bike. But so I'll tell you what it hasn't got, and I hate it, I hate for saying this, it hasn't got a centre stand. And you know what really annoys me about it? Is that underneath there are the holes for the spindle for the centre stand. So it's all there, it just needs to stand put it on it, but they don't do it, you don't get it. But you can have it, but you'll have to pay extra for it. I don't know, that's just one of my, uh, one of my pet hates. But I'll tell you the best thing about this bike, the very, very best thing, and that's its comfort, the riding position, because it's so, so comfy. And if you've got a bad back, perfect. If you've got a bad back, this is the style of machine that you need, because really, you could sit here all day long. You know, I can't begin to tell you just how comfy this bike is. Cutting through busy rush hour traffic is easy. The bike's nice and light and it's all very manoeuvrable. Now, it may have been around for some time, but this new Transalp, or the XL650V to give it the full title, certainly doesn't feel or look dated. And on the road, it'll cost you £5,400.
And here it is, was it? Honda's CB1300. Do you know very much about these? Well, Honda have been trying to get in on the muscle bike market for a long time, haven't they? We, they have. we go back a few years, the CB1. Yeah, CBX, the big massive oh, six that cylinder. That worked, didn't it? Yeah, well, that was great. Yeah. Been trying to build on that heritage. CB1 came first, then they got the Blackbird motor, went off on a tangent, gave us the X11. That's right. Neither yeah. really found favour. Well, they reckon this is, uh, is, it might just do the trick for them. It looks right, doesn't it? Mm. It's not a semi retro, nice red and white colour scheme. It's a Honda, so it's going to be okay, we think. Just but, hope it's got a bit of aggression. Well, eh? 30 points to beat, eh? Hey, let's give it a go. The CB1300 is Honda's newest old bike, if you care to see what I mean. With a heavy growling engine and 107 brake horsepower encased in a heavy 80s style bike. Honda seem to have developed an uncanny knack over the years for producing bikes that do their job with so little fuss that we almost take them for granted now. Well, guess what? They've gone and done it again with the new CB1300. Lots of four-cylinder machines need to hit somewhere around 6,000 RPM before anything exciting starts to happen. This CB1300 develops its peak power at a low leap 5,800 RPM and it will pull cleanly in just about any gear from as little as 1,500 RPM. Make no mistake, this bike is big and it's heavy, but it's not intimidating in any way. In fact, it's easy to ride and it handles really well. And since riding it, I've been avoiding motorways and fast A roads in favour of more challenging B roads. And it's not very often you'd say that about something which weighs 240 kilos and has 1300 cc's. The gearbox is typical Honda, super slick with no hints of any false neutrals. The steering is more than sharp enough to have some real fun on the twisties, although the suspension could be a touch on the soft side for any serious boy racer types. Looks wise, this is not quite as retro as some of the other bikes in this class, but it has a kind of pleasant mix of new and old styling. As I said before, this is no sports bike, but I'm sure that in the right hands, this could certainly teach the boy racers a thing or two. And it's not slow either, with a top speed close to 140 miles an hour. So it's over to the scoreboard on Honda's CB1300. Styling seven out of 10, that engine just doesn't look retro enough. Performance, 8 out of 10, a fantastic motor that pulls cleanly from very low revs. Practicality, 8 out of 10, very, very comfortable and you could ride this every day of the week. Value, 7 out of 10, it's not quite the cheapest in this class. So, how does it compare to the GSX? Well, I would say it's probably a better bike to throw around. You could mm. probably have a bit more fun on this. Surprising given how big it looks, isn't it? Yeah, but as I said before, it's not intimidating. It handles really well, very, very smooth. Loads of power down at the bottom end, which is great. A very low revving, like most of them are. But there's just a problem with the, the style of it with me. Now, it's, you're saying it's not looking old enough, don't you? That's what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. And, and what, why is that? Well, what I'm saying is these bikes are retro. Make no mistake, they're made to look like 70s muscle bikes, but that engine... Oh, oh, I hadn't noticed I that. I mean, it's just a great big brand new lump of metal. I mean, put some cooling fins on it, put some dummy spark plugs on it if you want. Yeah. But if you're going to make a retro bike, go the whole hog. Give us a finned engine as well, give even, us a even if it's not air cool. Even if it's not air cool, make it look it. Mm. So that's 30 points, it's neck and neck with the GSX. Yeah, so, uh, but not all is lost because there's two more bikes still to play with, isn't Indeed there? Indeed there are. There are two more bikes left to come, as Paul has said. That's going to be in part two because this is the end of part one. Join us after the break when we'll be meeting Kawasaki's ZRX and Yamaha's XJR. We'll see you in a minute. Right, bad gag time. You're going to need some matches. Chuck us yours. Thank you. You need two of them. Sit down. So, two matches. One between your knees like that. Put the other one on the top like that. And go like that. Now you know what it feels like to be an elephant riding a scooter, or a fully grown adult riding a Sports 400. Such as this. Oh. It's actually the VFR 400R, the NC30 from Honda. It was the first of the proper Sports 400s to hit these shores back in the very beginning of the 90s, maybe the very last year or so of the 80s. It was really pretty exclusive and expensive then, since which there's been loads of 400s launched. They actually brought this one in officially, then they went grey, then there's a whole load of grey imports. This, though, is probably still the only one that has a V4 engine. It's huge fun, and we're going to play on it. 
<laughs> I feel huge. It makes you feel like Monster Man. I feel like John Wayne climbing onto a little tiny pony. And just like a proper little sports bike, we need to give it a really big handful of revs to move off from the start. Mind you, first gear is pretty tall, and once you've cleared that, the rest is easy. There's no doubt in that it's small, but it's only when you ride it do you realise how short it is. The front of the bike kind of disappears from below your field of view. You really are sat right over the front wheel. Now, it may have been small, but they packed a lot into the VFR 400R. For a start, there is that V4 engine, a little 400 baby VFR engine, obviously, which gives it that lovely note and that huge amount of torque in the bottom range for what is a small engine. Then we had little radical tricks, like the single-sided swinging arm, which on any bike was pretty rare then, and on something this tiny was incredible. There's a really lovely alley frame, which is definitely worth a quick look. And then, of course, that proper race bike geometry, so you're right over the front wheel. All in all, it was pretty advanced. There was nothing else like it, certainly on the UK roads at the time. But above all else, it was and is about attitude. Because when you climb on board, you've got to assume the position, Buster. With those rear sets, your head down, those low, low clip-on bars here at the front. Incredible braking. The size of the brakes on this thing would stop something three times its weight, no problem. The stripped out, almost naked cockpit up here, a real racer feel to it. And that's really what the whole 400 thing is all about, and that's why I like the idea of them, because there's something slightly naughty about it. A bit like having your first fag when you're perhaps a bit under 16. This bike clearly has no purpose other than going fast. There's nothing sensible or compromised about it. You can't tour. God knows you wouldn't want to sit on the back of the thing and there's nowhere to put luggage. Even to the point of if you've gone to the trouble of fitting a single-sided swinging arm at the back, why root the exhaust in front of it? Put it the other side. Let the world see. This is a racing bike for racers. Small racers, obviously. This particular bike hadn't yet been prepared for sale, and so it had a rather wobbly headstock, due, I suspect, to a dodgy bearing, and a very squared-off rear tyre, which made cornering a bit of an adventure. Nevertheless, the VFR's handling does shine through. There's no doubt that it is extremely flickable. It'll change direction quicker than you can plan it. The 400 sports bike class only exists at all because in Japan you have to take another test to ride a bigger bike. Therefore, they've squeezed every last iota of power from the 400 engine. Dealers over here soon realised that there was a bit of a market, and so the grey imports caught up, and eventually Honda stopped bringing the VFR in as an official import at all. Now, of course, there's a whole raft of 400s available. It might be a pocket rocket, but don't expect it to be that light on your wallet. This example on a J-plate, once all its little niggles have been put right, will set you back at a dealer the best part of three grand. You'll get it for less if you're really brutal with your dealer. And what could be better on the right day than getting out on a 400? OK, any Sport 600 is probably going to beat it, but not in the hands of most of us. And with the VFR 400, you're also getting that rare thing in such a fast and frantic class. That's a bike with not only that extra torque from the V4, but also a little bit of heritage and pedigree. Kawasaki's ZX-9R Ninja. Here it is. Been around for some time now, and it's always been very well respected. I can't ever recall it getting any really, really bad press. So it must have been about right from the start. Well, yes it was, but would you believe now it's even better? One of the things that's always appealed to me about the ZX-9 is that when you climb aboard, it actually feels incredibly sensible for an out-and-out -out sports bike, super bike. It's still got a single seat like many other sports bikes, but it's a big size single seat. It's not very thick, not all that comfy, but it's big enough to slide around on. And in fact, you could actually slide right to the front on this and it's not too much of a stretch to the bar, so you could sit almost upright if you wanted to. You wouldn't look a bit of a plonker riding around like that all day. And you certainly wouldn't be able to sustain that position for very long. Not if you wanted to enjoy the best feature about this bike, the power. Make no mistake, this is a very, very fast machine. 143 brake horsepower is the same as the previous ZX-9, but this new model does feel sharper and a bit more nimble than its predecessor. Most of the improvements aren't actually visible. The modifications to the motor include a new all-aluminium cylinder block with electroplated cylinders to save weight. 
It has tighter piston clearances to give an increased compression ratio, reshaped intake ports and a new, more efficient ram air system designed to scoop more fresh air into the now larger air box. Combine all of that with Kawasaki's unique throttle response sensor which first appeared on the 98 model and you have a motor with more mid-range and better efficiency. So say Kawasaki and I tend to agree. The power of this latest Ninja is fantastic. So most of the mods you can't see and there are more that you can't see. It's got a larger curved radiator than before. It's got a lighter clutch. There are modifications to the gearbox, smoother gear changes, and it's got a bigger, more powerful alternator. <laughs> so there you go. One of the most distinctive changes, of course, is to the styling, especially the front end here. This big pointy headlamp here. Underneath which sits this, what my colleague Jeff Stone referred to as a pooper scooper when he looked at this at last year's bike show. This is, of course, this huge air intake for the Ram Air system. And I have to say, there's nothing better in motorcycle, no better sound than a big Kawasaki sucking air in, get your head down over the tank, big fistful and just listen to the noise, it's terrific. And let me just show you this, watch this when I put the key in, turn the ignition on, watch the dials, look at that, wee, fantastic. You might remember, you've seen that before, the first time I saw that was on a Suzuki Hayabusa when we were in Spain testing out there. And what it is, the, it's a way of recalibrating themselves, the dials, they start at zero and they go to the full extent of the travel, recalibration every time you switch on, so you get a good accurate reading every time. Good, isn't it? Do you want to see it again? Watch, here we go. Whoa, look at that. The brakes, well, they're not any different to before, really, as far as the calipers go. It's a Kiko six spots, the old model had them. A little bit more to grab hold of now, though, because the discs are up from 296 to 310 millimeters, and superb they are as well. More mods down towards the back end. Swing arm, that's completely different. Well, sort of completely different. It's full of muck at the moment because of the British weather but it's now a pentagonal section swing arm instead of the normal sort of box square section. It's got this internal bracing in it. It's stiffer, more rigid than before, but would you believe it's actually lighter than before. Suspension, not much to talk about there, more or less the same. They've revised the damping in the front forks, but the back now, it has a ride height adjustment as standard, so you can adjust the ride height. Not a great deal, but a little bit. And they've also revised the rear suspension linkage a little bit as well to give a more rigid, a firmer and a much more sporty ride. There's a whole load of other technical modifications, mainly to the front end. The fork offset has been reduced by 5mm and the steering head bearing actually moved forward. They've even replaced the tapered steering head bearings with ball bearings in an effort to give the ZX9R a lighter feel through the bars. It's certainly better, although it does somehow just lack the cutting edge of Yamaha's R1. Now I doubt that many people would be brave enough to take a brand new ZX9R onto a racetrack, but that's the only place to really enjoy the power and ability of this machine. So here we are, a racetrack. You know, I got these directions off Wayne. I said to him the other day, I said, I want to set 143 horses loose on a racetrack. And he sent me here. What's it like? If you want something doing, do it yourself. Well, it wasn't quite the type of racetrack I had in mind. Although I wasn't exactly a million miles away from the real thing. I probably saved myself a few bob by leaving early anyway. Now this is more like it. A nice, short and fairly twisty circuit to try out this new ZX9R. OK then, on to the track. And starting grid, position number one, of course. But hang on, there's a car on grid number two. And it's my friend Wayne in his super-duper V6-powered Ford Mondeo. Well, that's the last I'll see of him for the rest of the day. Now the new Ninja behaved itself superbly well on the circuit. Throttle response is absolutely instantaneous. The amount of power on tap really is quite awesome. The steering is certainly lighter than on previous models, but there is still plenty of feedback through the bars, even when powering hard out of a corner. Price-wise, it's in the same ballpark as Yamaha's R1 and Honda's new Fireblade at just over £8,000. Performance-wise, it's as fast as you'll ever need. 
Well, there's absolutely no doubt about it. This is the only place to enjoy a bike like this. Racetrack, superbike, the perfect combination. It really is a superbike, the new ZX9R. Tons and tons of mid-range, much better than the old ZX9. Sharper steering than the old one, but I have to say, perhaps still not quite as flicky as like your R1 and maybe your GSX-R. But the superb bike, excellent brakes, slam the brakes on at the end of the straight, lap after lap after lap, no fading, very, very positive, great, great fun. In fact, I think I could probably just squeeze another dozen laps in, excuse me. Winter's starting to draw in very fast now. It's getting very cold and damp, especially in the morning. So maybe it's about time to put the superbike away for a couple of months, keep it nice and clean and shiny. Well, if you do that, what's your alternative? You could use a car, of course, but then you'll be stuck in a traffic jam on a motorway all day. Not a lot of fun. You could, of course, use a little scooter. Well, the trouble with little scooters is, well, they're little, aren't they? And if you do use a motorway, you'll struggle to keep up with the rest of the traffic. So we need a big scooter. Well, here is a very big scooter. Suzuki's Bergman, all 400 cc's of it. Well, if you want to split hairs, it's actually only 385 cc's. But it was the first of the new breed of larger capacity scooters, aimed at eliminating the problems of the smaller machines, which can often feel underpowered with their little two-stroke motors. Having ridden the Bergman around for a few days, I've noticed that more people ask the question, What's it really like than they've ever done when I've turned up on some fancy sports bike? It seems to me that bikers are genuinely intrigued and interested to learn more about this machine. They want to borrow it and try it out. Those that do usually return with a smile on their face and then agree, if somewhat reluctantly, that it's actually rather good. Just about the ultimate rev and go. Well, there's not a great deal to look at mechanically on a Bergman because it's just one huge lump of plastic and it is huge as well. It's physically quite a big machine. But despite that, the height of the seat is definitely worth a mention. Look at that. Look how low to the ground it is. Now, that can be a problem on even the smallest of scooters, little 50cc scooters. Just because they've got a small engine doesn't mean they've got a low seat height. Some of them are actually quite tall. But on this, despite its large capacity and big physical size, no such problem. So short riders, no trouble at all. If I just pop it onto its main stand, we can just have a closer look at the actual brakes on it because they're definitely worth a mention. At the front here, you'll see there's two hoses there going to this caliper for the front disc, and it's disc brakes front and rear on this one. And the reason there's two hoses is because it's got a linked brake system, which means when you pull this left-hand lever on the handlebars here, it breaks the back as normal, but it also breaks the front. So that breaks back and front, and this one over here just breaks the front linked brakes very very clever as i say you can't see anything mechanically on this but under there is the engine 400 cc's single cylinder water-cooled engine and it actually lies flat sort of along the chassis really the cylinder goes that way if i would take the bodywork off you'd see what i was talking about but it goes that way which means the piston's going up and down along the length of the bike that helps to keep the weight down and it also means that you've got more space under your seat because you've not got a cylinder stuck up there taking all the room up and under the seat there's actually quite a bit of room. Opens up that way, supported on this strut here. And as you can see, a full face helmet in there. No problem. It has to go that way. You can't put it that way because it won't shut. But if you put it that way, it'll shut quite easily. Plenty of room in there. Also helping to keep the weight down and keep the weight low, should I say, not so much down but low, is the petrol tank, which is there. Filler caps there and the petrol tank is beneath there. So again, lots and lots of weight low down. Moving up here, look at this here. This is a brake lock because you've got a problem on a scooter because it's automatic. You can't leave it in gear. So if you park on an incline, it will roll away. Normal motorbike, you just leave it in gear. So this has a brake lock. Just pull that down there and it puts a little lock cable operated on the back wheel. Stops it rolling away. So quite a good idea. Next to that, a funny, strange little arrangement here for the ignition. Take your key out. You pop that down and it covers the ignition hole there, so you can't put a key in, you can't put a screwdriver in. So to release that, you use the back of the key, which is shaped there, to match that little socket there. Give that a flick, that pops up, and there you go. You can stick your key back in and you're away. Then onto the dashboard up here. A nice dashboard on this with everything you'll need. Not a lot of warning lights. There's a warning light for the brake lock and there's one for the high beam and that's it. But you've got a clock, you've got a 
digital trip there, two different trips on this, analog speedo, fuel gauge, which I always keep saying, every bike should have a fuel gauge and a temperature gauge. And that dashboard at night looks really nice, actually. You won't see this now during the day. But at night, when you've got your lights on, it's got a lovely kind of icy blue backlight to it. It looks really, really smart. Very nice. Up here, then, a big screen. Not the biggest of screens I've ever seen, but it does actually do a reasonable job. It keeps the worst of the wind blast off your chest and your, your neck area. So it's, uh, it's quite useful. And that's quite important because this, remember, might only be a scooter, but it's 400 cc's and it's capable of cruising at 85 miles an hour plus all day long. And that may sound amazing, but it's true. The top speed is quoted as 97 miles an hour. But I have to say that anything above 80 should really be reserved for only the very straightest of roads, because the Bergman does have a tendency to start weaving around at high speed when things get a little twisty. I think due to a combination of 13 inch wheels and a very long wheelbase. But of course, you shouldn't be doing those kind of speeds. That said, it's very difficult to find fault with this machine. Perhaps its big problem lies with its image, or lack of it. It's often seen as rather uncool to ride round on a scooter. But more and more bikers are waking up to the idea that these machines are more than capable of doing the job. I'd say, swallow your pride, try one out, you might just like it. You know, I really, really do like this Bergman. I don't mind admitting it. And I think it's the only scooter really at the moment that's got any real respect from the bike world, if you like. But it is, it's very, very comfy. You could sit on this all day long. You can put your feet up there, the old feet forward riding position. You can have your feet down there, big comfy seat. There's even a backrest there for the rider, so you're not gonna get a sore back. And even the pillion gets little footboards like that. Look at them. None of your little foot pegs on this. And how about that for the pillion seat? That is the height of luxury, if ever I've seen it there. Fantastic seat, that. that's bigger than the whole seat on some of the sports bikes that I've been on. I mean, that is superb. And a nice little backrest there for the pillion, so the pillion isn't gonna fall off the back. You could notice on this one that it's had a little rack fitted. That's a little aftermarket accessory because of course this is a second hand machine. This has done just over 3,000 miles from new. And if you wanted to buy this one, you could save a thousand pounds on the new price. This is on offer at just three and a half grand. A brand new Bergman, now on the road, will cost you four and a half thousand pounds. And you know, I'd go anywhere on this. I think you could go touring on this dead easily because it's comfortable, it's got the performance, it'll keep up with everything else on the road, well, apart from your top super bikes. It's got the comfort, it's got luggage carrying capacity. You could put a top box on there and if you were on your own, you could strap loads and loads of stuff on this pillion seat there. Take anything you needed with you. I think my next touring holiday could be on a Suzuki Bergman because really this is all you'll ever need. Unless, of course, you've got a mate like mine who happens to own one of these. Alan, have you, uh, are we ready? 